there's a interesting contrast that uh, God has Paul make in these verses that I just want us to look at a few of them. But I want to begin reading in verse 21, because here is an allegory that he uses. He uses Ishmael and Isaac as an allegory of the law versus grace. Here's what he says. Verse 21 of Galatians 4. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? Okay, here's a here's a, a spiritual picture. For these two, these two sons, they represent two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, that's the old covenant that God gave through Moses, which gendereth, gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, here's where I want you to really listen, verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Okay? Verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, if you go back and look at the, the origin of this allegory that Paul uses in Genesis chapter 16, you're familiar with it, where Abraham is 85, and 10 years prior to that, God said he was going to give him a seed, and he hasn't had any for 10 years, no son. His wife's 10 years younger than him. She's up in age, no child. And so his wife comes to him and says, hey, Abraham, you know, the culture and the legal uh, process around here is that we can have our son uh, through one of our our servants. And so why don't you take my servant and through her, we'll have our son. To put it in other terms, you know, God hasn't done it. And so maybe he's expecting us to help him out. And so let's take matters into our own hands here. And uh, let's see if we can produce that promised son that God gave us uh, the promise of. You know, when you think about it, I don't know if you've ever realized this. Did you ever realize that Abraham received the fulfillment of all of God's promises through Ishmael? Here's what I mean. Through Ishmael, Abraham received descendants. And that's what the covenant promise through Isaac was, that he have seed, descendants, and land. And through Ishmael, Abraham received land. And it came through all of Ishmael's children. Because when you read the, the uh, Genesis, you find out that Ishmael had 12 boys. He had 12 sons. And each one of them turned out to be a king called a prince. So he had 12 sons. Each one of them was a prince. 
And each one of those 12 sons that were princes or kings formed a nation. 12 nations came from Ishmael's 12 sons. There was only, so, so I guess the question is, why is Isaac necessary? If all the promises that God gave to Abraham, Ishmael was able to fulfill, why was Isaac necessary? Simply because there is one thing that Ishmael couldn't give Abraham that only Isaac could. You know what that is? <laughs> Obviously, the only thing that Isaac, uh, that Ishmael could not give the world that uh, Isaac did was the Messiah. Isaac was the only son because he was the promised son that God said the Messiah, the seed would come through. He was the one, Isaac, that brought redemption to this world through Messiah Jesus, who is a descendant of Isaac and not Ishmael. So that being said, I want to pause and have a word of prayer. And I want to do a contrast of the, between these two sons and make application. Uh, to our lives. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much uh, for the way in which you use scripture to paint pictures for us and give us uh, real lessons for life and, and understanding about Bible truth, how important it is that we are children of the promise. Oh God, how we thank you for that. We're the descendants, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, the Bible says. And it's because of that physical descendant of Abraham, Messiah Jesus. We thank you for it. We pray that you'll open our spiritual eyes tonight and use this to really teach us and touch our hearts through it. And Lord, show us what you want us to see. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me contrast these two sons of Abraham. First of all, Ishmael. You know what Ishmael represents? Ishmael represents self-effort. Look at the, that 29th verse. He that is born after the flesh. Same thing that is said in verse 23. Ishmael was of the bondwoman, was born after the flesh. So Ishmael represents the flesh. Ishmael represents to us self effort. That is, humans like us working in our own strength. That's really at the root of what is held up to be the American spirit. You know what the American spirit is? It's rugged individualism. It's, uh, it's you form your own character and life by your own self-effort by self-determination. You know that self-determination, when you think about it, is really the essence of what sin is? It all began with uh, who we call Satan. He self-determined that he wasn't going to fall in line with God. And the, and the temptation of Eve in that Garden of Eden was a temptation to determine for yourself what's right and wrong. And so the very root and essence of sin is self-determination, self-effort, you deciding for yourself what you will or will not do, what you will be, what you'll make of yourself. A person like this, the Ishmael, self-effort, is a person that does not really see God as very necessary at all in their life. They're self-made people. They're self-reliant people. And uh, at the end of their life, it looks good, maybe. They look back and they say, look at what I did. Or I did this my way. And look at how successful I was. That's Ishmael. He represents self-effort, the flesh. Isaac, on the other hand, he represents God's action in a person's life. Look at verse 28. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. 
And that's the same thing that verse 23 says, he, Isaac, of the free woman, was by promise. So Isaac doesn't represent self-effort, but he reveals God's activity in human life, in a human life, in a person. He, Isaac, represents the fulfillment of God's promises in a person's life, the fulfillment of God's will. It's He represents God working in and through our lives. He represents a person that that lets God develop their character and put his own image in their heart and in their life. He represents a, a person that allows God to conform them to the image of Christ. That's Ishmael, or or rather Isaac, so different from Ishmael. Self-effort versus God's action or activity. That's the contrast between Abram's two sons. Then I want you to think about the results or the consequences that are produced by Abraham's two sons. First of all, Ishmael's life. In verse 30 of Galatians 4, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Ishmael's life, because it is it represents self-effort, the flesh, his life represents the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, describes what the works of the flesh look like. It's something that you and I make happen. That's the works of the flesh. It, 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 uh, the results often look productive. They look productive. But you know, the problem is there's no salvation in it. There's no life-giving power in the works of the flesh. When it's all said and done and it's measured at the end, it's a wasted life the works of the flesh produces. It is totally impotent to change the life. It is forever a barren life. There is nothing of eternal value in the works of the flesh, in that kind of a life, in that Ishmael life. In fact, it's a violent life and a very destructive life. Listen to this. This is when Hagar and Ishmael are in the desert, and the Lord comes to her, and he tells her that she's going to have a son. She's pregnant at the time. You're going to be with child. You're going to bear a son. You're going to call his his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. Listen to this. Here's the description of Ishmael even before he's born. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. He's going to be like a wild donkey, is what he's saying here. He's going to be untamable. He's going to be admired and uh, and valued as an animal. And... uh, his descendants are going to be living in proximity to Abraham's other descendants, but they're going to live in defiance to Abraham and his descendants, and there's going to be hostility between them. And that's what we have today in the Arab-Jewish dilemma. It all predicted here. It's the Ishmael life, a life that actually creates violence and in the end destruction. What's the result that is produced or the consequences by Isaac's life? Well, Isaac's life, because he is born of promise, he reveals the fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. In that Galatians 5 passage, the fruit of the Spirit is contrasted with the works of the flesh. And so Isaac's life represents the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. It is Isaac's life that really injects hope into the whole human family, because through him a deliverer from sin will come, 
and through him, the eternal separation that exists between fallen man and God, that, that will be bridged, that gap will be spanned. And human beings will be able, as a result of Isaac's seed, will be able to be placed back in an eternal relationship with God, will be rescued. And you know, we're involved in that rescue ourselves because we have been rescued. We have the privilege of partnering with God to rescue others and bring life to them. And uh, that life of faith in, that is in God's promise, found in God's promise. Well, then let's just think about the conclusion of this. This is where we really apply it to ourselves. And this is perhaps the most important part of our thoughts tonight. Which of these two sons defines you? <clears throat> is it Isaac or Ishmael? Which of these two boys defines you? The, remember, Ishmael is the self-life. And so we need to ask ourselves this question. Are you working hard to change yourself and to define your own character? If you're the only one at work in your life, then your attention will be completely absorbed in yourself. You'll be talking about what you did, and that's always personally destructive. Which of the two sons defines you, Isaac or Ishmael? Isaac, he represents the Christ life. That is, if Christ is working in your life, your focus won't be on yourself. Your focus will be on the Lord. And you will be resting because you will be trusting and depending in him. And as a result, you'll enjoy peace in your heart even when things around you aren't peaceful. Or even when there are things that would uh, seek to destroy your peace, you'll have his peace in your heart. You'll enjoy it. And you'll be talking about what God does and what God did. And that's always refreshing and encouraging. And it's a blessing because it's life-giving to others. So let's make this evaluation here. How do we figure whether or not we are living an Ishmael life or an Isaac life, a self-life? or a Christ life? Well, ask yourself this question. Is your life, that is, everything that pertains to it, your daily schedule, your daily to-do list, uh, your activities, uh, your time out for socializing, entertainment, R&R, &R, you know what that is, rest and relaxation. Is that an occasion for you? or for God. That's the evaluation here. That's how you're going to figure out whether you're living an Ishmael life or an Isaac life, whether it's a self life or a Christ life. Every area of your life, is that for yourself or is it for God? And how important is your time with the Lord each day? And if it's important, then how well do you protect it? How much of your thoughts and your activities each day is the Lord a part of? Your answer to those questions reveals whether you're living an Ishmael or an Isaac life. The difference between dead living existence or a God-focused versus a self-centered life, a life of being a blessing, Christ-centered life, or being a burden to others. Something to think about.